mission statement. That statement is, we are a voluntary grassroots membership organization dedicated to working within the Republican Party to advance the principles of individual rights, limited government, and free markets. And that's why we're here tonight. Again, I'd like to welcome everyone. Is there anyone that's here for the first time to our caucus? Could you please stand up and introduce yourself? Yourself, tell us where you're from and why you're here. Oh, okay. Well, mm. my name's Mike Hoffman. I live in Leesburg now. I'm actually an tax and firearm refugee from Connecticut. Um, <laughs> rather than register my high capacity magazines, I left the state. Um, and that's the best they lost. They're still sending me uh, my retirement check from the state police. I'm a real dangerous guy. <laughs> and uh, I'm a benefactor member of the NRA. And I volunteer for them at the uh, national show as much as they can. So, Great, thank you. Thank you. Who else? Yes, sir. I'm all. My name is Dennis Beaver. I live in Zello. And uh, I used to live in Lake County years ago, so I was on the North Lake mailing list. So I got the email about this meeting tonight. So I'm, I'm retired from Lockheed Martin. Very good. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Is there anyone else that's new here for the first time? Yes, sir. Please read it. Please bird. I'm here to hold on my guns. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. I'd like, I'd like to encourage everyone who's not on our distribution list, if you could please share your contact information with us. With our secretary, Meredith Morrow, at the door. Good. And we'll add you to our distribution list. Thank you so much. Is there uh, any candidates? <laughs> There's two of them, right? <laughs> All three? Yeah, three. Oh, oh Jim okay. still. Can we start first? Yes. So, um, Carrie Becker, Lake County Property Appraiser, running for re election. I own the A.W. Peterson Gun Shop, the oldest gun shop in the nation, available for all your hunting and shooting needs. <laughs> uh, former state representative, state senator, co-sponsored the Castle Doctrine Bill, co-sponsored the, um, well, every gun for 10 years, every gun bill was there. I was either a sponsor or co-sponsor. I'm also a benefactor life member of the NRA, and, um, and I run a very tight ship at the Lake County Property Appraiser's Office. We're very yes. innovative. Uh, we we uh, do good things for the community, and we are the per capita, the, the second lowest cost property appraiser's office in the state of Florida, yet we provide increasingly better services all the time at a very low cost. As a realtor, I'll tell you, he uses his, his stuff to improve it. makes my life so much simpler. Uh, you just click and find out anything about anything. And of course, I, um, I allow my employees to carry a consume if they have a permit. And, and luckily, thanks to Josh's leadership, uh, the county also allows their employees. So, uh, yes. and, and also, just as an aside, and maybe some of you know this, but in, in Lake County, we have 47,000 concealed weapon permit holders, which puts us probably either number one or number two per capita in concealed weapon permits. In counties that are similar size, we just blow them away. We have a lot more permits, so we are a very, uh, very pro-gun county. This is sort of for your benefit to know, you know where you're at. Um, and uh, the fact that they you know, elected a gun shop owner to three different offices. And matter of fact, my daddy was the first elected Republican to any office in Lake County in 1962, previously owned the gun shop. So. Uh, it's a good place to live, a good place to be. And going. what are those cards you have in your hand? Yeah, if you're, uh, if you're a county resident, I'd love to have you sign, I'm a registered voter, I'd love to have you sign this. I've gotten most of everybody's signature, so that's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Josh Blake, I'm on the Lake County Commission for District 5. I a week and a half ago filed to run for my second and final term on the County Commission. And uh, I do not yet have those printed up. It's still fresh, but I will be back and I'll have petition cards. Good. Great. I'm Jim Miller. 
I'm sort of uh, running for uh, school sort board of. again. Because uh, I was one back in the day. In fact, Marie, when she first started coming, I was on the board. And so we, go, Marie and I go way back. Um, I wasn't going to go again, but then when uh, the seat fell open, and I, the board right now is so much more fun to play with. The superintendents could be much more fun to play with. I think I'm going to try it again. So, uh, um, watch what you say. And here. I think I've got everybody um, already signed up tonight. I appreciate it. I have to leave early. I, my son's caregiver didn't make it tonight, so I need to go do that. But anyway, so. Thank you. Thank you. You always leave early. She's an elected. I serve on the North Lake County Hospital Board, which is a taxing district, which if you live in the North Lake County area, you get to pay taxes to that board. <laughs>
those two guys and some others put together a nice team to make it easy for us to go around and visit all our reps and to be knowledgeable about the legislation that we're either supporting or opposing. But it's a great event, and if anybody wants to go up there, even if you just want to go for a day, let us know. The details on hotels and trips, a lot of us carpool to get up there. Maria and I actually have a van that seats 10 people, so we, we, we can take a crowd with us, and we're willing to go up there for the whole, the whole time. So it's a Tuesday and a Wednesday right after uh, Martin Luther King. Day in January, January 21 and 22. So now I would like to begin our program by introducing this gentleman that I just recently met. He came to me with my um, credentials. His name is DJ Parton. He is the executive director of a group called Florida Gun Rights. DJ serves as the executive director of Florida Gun Rights, where he also serves as the registered lobbyist, representing more than 200,000 members and supporters of Florida Gun Rights. In this role, he is responsible for advocating for pro-gun legislation, such as constitutional carry, fighting against all gun control legislation, he is also responsible for communicating with members on pressing issues facing the Second Amendment. After growing up in Mobile, Alabama, DJ attended the University of South Alabama, where he found his love for liberty and desire to fight for the Second Amendment. During this time, DJ worked as a state chair for Young Americans for Liberty and formed the largest student gun rights group in the state of Alabama. He also served six years as an airborne infantryman in the Alabama Army National Guard, ending his military career as a sergeant. And thank you for your service, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> DJ now resides in Tallahassee with his wife, McKendra, and their small arsenal. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about that later. <laughs> Small keywords. <laughs> they are proud members of City Church. DJ enjoys spending time with his wife, reading, mowing the lawn. Hey, I got two acres. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really like mowing because I only have a, I have a small yard. <laughs> and shooting at Talon Range. His favorite firearm is his Marlin 3030 and his Springfield Army, Armory 1911. Please, everyone, welcome DJ. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I got some notes on my phone, if that's all right. Uh, but I'm definitely much more of a conversationalist than I am a public speaker. So y'all feel free to ask questions, stop me along the way. Uh, if I misspeak or say something that's not clear, just let me know. Um, but uh, I'm really glad to be here tonight. Uh, two of my favorite things to do, or two of my favorite things to talk about are religion and politics. And uh, this is a venue that I can actually talk about one of those things. So um, I'm very grateful to be here with, uh, with some liberty lovers. Um, so I want to go ahead and give you guys some key takeaways. Uh, from what I'm going to talk about today, and also, how long do I have? Oh, we'll just go for it. We'll, we'll, we'll look at it. 10, 11 o'clock. That's fine. How about 20, 30 minutes? That's that okay. That might be too much. But, uh, okay. okay. Uh, I was just curious. So, uh, the few key takeaways that I want you guys to have um, from this, and then I'll kind of expand on those. Uh, so, the first one is the situation in Tallahassee is not good uh, with regards to our second amendment. Um, but the second one is it's not hopeless, uh, and it's thanks to people like you guys who are willing to come out on a Wednesday, Wednesday night to, uh, uh, to talk about liberty and talk about our gun rights. So uh, it, it's not hopeless, but it is, it is pretty rough. Uh, 
And the only way that we're going to change that is by changing the environment in Tallahassee. Um, and I'm not talking about climate change or any, that sort of thing. Political climate change, because right now, uh, the climate that they're dealing with is they're dealing with uh, crying children, uh, telling people that these scary guns need to be banned. They're dealing with uh, parents who lost their, their, their children in such a tragic way. Um, and it, there has now become a culture where it's okay for the Republican to vote for gun control in Tallahassee. And not only vote for it, but to sponsor it and to push and, and to, to advocate for its passage. So uh, the culture right now in Tallahassee is bad. But thanks to people like you uh, getting together, calling the legislators, signing petitions, which uh, I'll talk about in a little bit, um, and uh, uh, joining with uh, organizations like Florida Gun Rights who are at, or Republican Liberty Caucus who are uh, actively fighting for the Second Amendment in Tallahassee is going to help us change the culture. So most of you probably know that in 2018, uh, they passed the Marjorie Stallman Douglas Public Safety Act, uh, which was after they, they had it was such an emotional time in Tallahassee when uh, it, it's emotional for everybody, no matter your political beliefs when something like that happens uh, down in Parkland. But these guys took it and took the blame out on gun owners. And they passed the largest gun control expansion in the history, uh, championed by Senate President Bill Galvano. And, uh, well, he was Senate President designate at the time. And uh, then um, supported by a majority of Republican caucus in both chambers. Um, fast forward to today, and State Rep. Anthony Sabatini, I believe you're his fiance, right? Congratulations. Same pictures on Facebook, I just never met you. Um, <laughs> Congratulations as to him, though. That's true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, uh, State Rep. Anthony Sabatini. Uh, filed for his first ever constitutional carry bill, um, and we are very, very excited and very thankful for him doing that. Um, it's giving us something to start talking about, to instead of us constantly being on defense, where we're taking hit after hit after hit uh, from the anti-gun left, um, and all we're doing right now is playing defense, well, Rep. Sabatini's bill, constitutional carry bill, as well as Rep. Mike Hill's HB 6003, uh, which would repeal the gun control of 2018, Having those program bills introduced gives us something to fight for, gives us something to push back on, and, and helps us start changing the culture in Tallahassee. If you've seen any of the news lately, Galvano is pledging action. The headline was Galvano, Senate President Galvano pledges action on gun control, or on gun violence, which just means he's considering more gun control. Senator Tom Lee came out to endorse gun control. Tom Lee voted against 726, uh, but he, a uh, Republican, is now supporting uh, universal background checks. Um, which is just firearm registration. I'm happy to clarify on why that is if anybody wants to talk about that. But uh, David Simmons, who's the uh, state of defense, pro tem, uh, so he's the president pro tem, and he, uh, he came out and said that he wants to prohibit 25 year olds and under from being able to purchase assault weapons. He defines assault weapons as any firearm capable of holding more than 10 rounds. I have some pistols that would be banned under that. Uh, so it's the Republicans in the Senate right now have this culture of uh, gun control where it's okay for them to start calling for restrictions on the Second Amendment. But in, or in, in the House now that we're able to fight for some pro Second Amendment things, not a single House Republican that I've seen yet has said anything to support gun control this session. And it, it's I'm not saying that that's just because we're able to that's just because we're going on offense, but it, it partially has something to do with it. Because right now they're having to, they're, they're having their constituents call and say, "Hey, are you going to, you going to help Sabatini out? Are you going to push this constitutional carry bill? Hey, when are you guys going to repeal this red flag gun confiscation?" Um, and we are, we are slowly but surely changing the culture in Tallahassee. It's thanks to people like you guys. So I brought in uh, some petitions for constitutional carry. Uh, does anybody need me to explain it? Please don't. Sure. Go, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so constitutional carry is the, is the idea that uh, the Second Amendment is the only permit you need. Um, so in order to exercise your Second Amendment rights, you should not have to ask the government for, for permission. You should not have to submit your fingerprints to the government. You should not have to pay a tax to exercise your right to, uh, to, to carry a firearm. Um, so that's what the bill would do. It would keep the permit system in place. 
Uh, so if you want to go to Georgia, Alabama, any other state that has reciprocity with the state of Florida, you can still get your permit, um, but it's just not required. Uh, so it, no other right, uh, no other constitutionally guaranteed right is taxed um, except for the Second Amendment. You have to pay, I, I think it averages out to about 140 or 150 every time you get a, a permit in the state of Florida. Um, but if you started calling for um, uh, permits to go on Facebook, people might actually like that. Uh, but if you started uh, calling for permits in order to be a member of the press or something like that, there would be an uproar. Uh, it's absolutely insane that we have to pay a tax exercise constitutionally guaranteed right. Um, any questions? Yes, sir. Did you, if, in that in that bill, doesn't that include an open carry? It does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Good point. Um, so in Florida, Florida's one of five states in the country that outright bans open carry. Uh, South Carolina is the only other southern state. The rest of them are California, Illinois, and New York. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, speaking of California, uh, Florida, if you carry without a concealed weapons license, you can be charged with a felony in prison for five years and fined with five thousand dollars for five thousand dollars. It's far worse than the penalty in California. Um, so, our state is, our Republican controlled legislature has led us to be more like California and is refusing to restore our constitutional rights. Um, so, the petition, uh, we deliver all petitions that are signed. Um, if you want to read the actual copy of the petition, because that's just a basically like a sign up sheet, on the very back, I have copies of the petition if you'd like to read what it actually says. Yes, sir. I got a question. Okay, so constitutional carry yes. is what this petition is for. Yep. Okay, let's say I've never owned a gun, mm -hmm. and I go to Peterson's gun shop, and I was and I buy a gun. Right? What will be different than what I do today? Okay. Uh, so, if you've never had a gun or anything like that, that will be different than you purchase a firearm. You fill out the form. They'll call it in, and they'll do a background check on you. Is there a delay? Uh, and so forth, yes. Three or three. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, some of the gun control that has been passed uh, requires three-day waiting periods on all handgun purchases, which is in the state constitution, um, and a three-day waiting period on all uh, long gun purchases, long gun shotgun purchases right now, thanks to what they did in 2018. So um, one way that people get around this is by having a permit. They show their permit, and they're exempted from When you say permit, you mean a concealed carry permit? It's called a pistol permit in Alabama, so that's okay. drilled in my head. Concealed weapons license. Um, so uh, if you give that to your FFL, the, the gun dealer, the guy you're buying a gun from, um, he is- Peterson's gun shop. <laughs> <laughs> that's the example you used. Your name is Mr. Peterson. Baker's by the way. Baker. Well, if, if you're, you're speakers, trying to get a gun from Mr. Baker over there, all you have to do is hand over your, uh, your uh, license to carry. Um, <laughs> and he, uh, you, you don't have to do the wait, wait period. So uh, that's one of the benefits of having a permit, but that doesn't create a reason to require people to have a permit. Um, my wife is. Uh, new to Florida, we just got married this year, and um, hasn't gotten her license to carry yet. We don't live in a great part of a horrible city, um, Tallahassee, so it, it's, she can't go for a walk by herself, and if she <coughs> chose to, she wouldn't have a way to defend herself because she, we haven't gotten her license to carry yet. So, um, it's absurd that she would be punished for trying to defend herself on a walk around her neighborhood um, just because she didn't want to pay a tax to the state uh, to exercise her right. Um, yes, sir. Did you say the permit would stay in place? Did I understand you correct? Yes. So you could still go get a permit. Why would you, what would, why would you do that? Um, so one reason would be to get uh, exempt from the 308 period. Um, for me, I travel all over the place, and uh, not every state is a constitutional carry state. Um, a true constitutional carry state 
allows for non-residents to also carry without a permit. There's some constitutional carry states that require a residency. Um, long term, all of the United States, ideally all of the United States would be constitutional carry and you don't need a permit at all for anything. Um, and there's no benefit. But when, when we're looking at constitutional carry legislation and trying to figure out if it's a good bill or a bad bill, sometimes people introduce it without talking to us, which is fine. Um, sometimes they're bad bills that need to be fixed. We ask the question, does a permit holder have more rights than a non-permit holder? And if that's the case, then it's a bad bill, or it doesn't go far enough. Um, so if you can carry as a permit holder um, in a restaurant that serves alcohol, but if you don't have a permit, you can carry it everywhere else, but you can't carry it in a restaurant that serves alcohol, well, that's a restriction on your constitutional right. Um, and I'm not advocating for drinking and carrying a gun, but that's uh, just <laughs> um, so, uh you, you get certain benefits right now for having a concealed weapons license, even if you are in a constitutional carry state, unfortunately. We're still, that's part of the long-term plan, but right now the goal is just to get rid of the government requirement to, to pay a tax for your right. To concealed carry. To concealed or open carry. Or open carry. Or open carry. States that have passed, uh, passed constitutional carry, have they experienced any problems that the liberals said, I mean, the wild, wild west and all this stuff, scare tactics they always used, what do they point to once this has become a movement and we have established constitutional carry? They point to guys who walk into police stations carrying ARs. Uh, that's their only argument, is people who want to push buttons and, and that sort of thing. Um, it, that's their only argument, because in states that have passed constitutional carry, um, well, first, let's consider the fact that Florida's behind Mississippi on this. Florida's behind New Hampshire. Florida's behind Maine. Uh, there's another Northeast state that I'm missing. Is it Vermont? Vermont? Vermont, yes. Vermont's the first one. It used to be called Vermont Carry um, because Vermont never passed a law requiring you to have a permit to exercise your constitutional right. Which is weird because it's the land of Bernie Sanders, but they have better gun freedom than we do right now, at least as far as that goes. So, to answer your question, uh, Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire were, were listed as the top three safest states in the country this year. Um, so, uh, of course, you can get into causation and different things that, that go into that, but uh, the argument that constitutional carry turns people into the wild, wild west or turns state wild, wild west and people in the streets. It's absolutely absurd. Yes, sir. I've read that uh, the majority of these mass shootings have been in gun-free zones. Yes, that is 100% true. Uh, Dr. John Locke, who was an economist at the University of Chicago, um, is a he, he does a lot of research on um, how gun laws and how laws in general affect uh, the safety. Of, uh, of the country and the states that they're in. Um, and he found that the vast majority of these mass shootings, and he defines mass shootings in there, uh, I believe he defines it the same way the FBI does, uh, but the vast majority of those happen in so called gun free zones uh, where we're not allowed to defend ourselves. You know, I walked into the Social Security Administration office one day, and uh, I, I think I lost my car and needed a new car or something. So I walk in, I have a pocket knife I'm from Alabama. I, everywhere with a pocket knife. Got a pocket knife on me. And this security guard who uh, uh, had a mean, I was going to say something mean, but won't do it. Um, security guard who uh, uh, was sitting over in the corner um, saw my pocket knife. That's all I had. I left my gun in the car. It's federal building. I knew that. Saw my pocket knife. I said, sir, you can't be in here with that. I'm in downtown Mobile. It's not horrible crime ridden, but it's not Probably Lake County. Um, so it, I had I had to go back to my car, take out my pocket knife. Um, which even if you don't think a gun's a tool, it's kind of hard to argue that a knife's not a tool. Um, and, and then come back in. So was, I don't know why I got on that, but that was just a fun story that drives me nuts to this day. Uh, any other questions? Come on, it's my favorite topic. Uh, it's not a question, it's just a, the pocket knife. Yes, sir. I just give a month of cash for them. Okay, because once a month I go on and make a buy back. <laughs> 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 That's where TSA gets thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars.
Yeah. And I could buy by the dozen this year for fifteen or twenty dollars. <laughs> Annie, tell them what you do with yours. Well, several times I've had to <coughs> take it outside and put it in the bushes. Yeah. At stadiums, I know they, they, they watch can't for it. You have to go through a a metal detector to get in there. The security guards take it. And there's other play performing arts center. One that I went to Orlando University. And I've I've ended up stashing it in the bushes many times, and I've also lost it just outright. But it always comes back to me. I didn't <laughs> say that. It, and it happens to be a wonderful night. Yeah, that's, that's right. In fact, it happens to be an NRA night. And I, I also let the TSA have it one time at the Orlando airport. But they, for 15 bucks, they'll mail it. They'll put it in a bag and mail it back. <laughs> so I've lost this. I guess it's got nine lives. Like eight, eight or nine. It's got nine. That, that's my nice story. I would just say that in Florida, a folding pocket knife with a blade of four inches or less is not considered a weapon. Uh, and the Florida Supreme Court ruled on that. That was their determination. Call it a pocket knife. Right. It's called a pocket knife. And so we had somebody that was stopped coming into a county commission yeah. meeting with a pocket knife. And I had to instruct the county attorney that they were allowed to carry that in our meetings. And we had to change policy and notify our security guards they could not take pocket knives from people coming into the commission. Good to know. Good. Tell, the the <laughs> tell the courthouse. Because politicians like being liked. 
um, I wasn't okay with the answer of I'm pro gun, but I have to see those bills. I, th those are, those might not be good policies or whatever. Um, so you start calling them out on stuff like that for being too soft, for being too squishy, for being spineless. Well, then they have to start taking a stronger stance. And now I've got a campaign manager calling me um, saying, "Hey, we want to fill out your survey and tell you, tell your members that we support all these things." Um, and now that's just talk. That, that doesn't mean they'll be good when it comes down to it. But there was a state senator in 2018 who should vote right on gun control. He should vote no on gun control. We had a conversation. He said he was voting for gun control. And when it came down to it, he voted no because Board of Gun Rights told every one of our members in his district that he, he told me he was going to vote for gun control. And he didn't like that very much, so he ended up voting no. Um, so that's what we have to do all across the state is to build up supporters of the Second Amendment who, at a moment's notice, can pick up the phone, say, hey, Anthony Sabatini, stop being stupid, vote for constitutional carry. Um, and Anthony's one of the principal ones, so you're probably not going to change his mind on whatever we're talking about. Uh, but, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the principal ones are the best ones. Um, they make my job easier. Uh, but that also works on the other side. Bernie Sanders, that's a principal guy. He's never going to vote our way. Um, he 100% believes in what he's talking about, and he's not going to change his political stance on, on certain issues like that. Um, so that kind of works against the liberty ideal um, there. But uh, it's on us to uh, fight for our liberties and fight for our freedom, uh, especially the Second Amendment, uh, the one that helps us defend the rest of them. So, we had two of our late county legislators that voted for that in 2018. Yep. And, and that was a big disappointment. One thing that... Luckily our state senator Dennis Baxter was in That's right. Yeah. That's right. Senator Baxter was also. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, one thing that is hard to do in politics, uh, even, even as an activist, people in general want to be liked. Um, but sometimes you have to you have to flat out disagree with somebody, tell them they're wrong. And in politics, you have to make them feel political pain. And political pain just means that it's things that hurt politicians, bad press. The biggest thing that hurts politicians is angry voters. So that means they're going to have to spend more money trying to convince you to vote for them. That means they're going to have to spend more time, more effort. And they just don't like being not liked. So if you are a voter in a district, and you're, especially if you know them personally, they get a phone call from you and say, hey, look, I don't, I don't like what you're doing right now. Um, and you actually mean it. it. It is politically painful for that politician. Um, and you can change the way they vote on, on certain legislation. And it's important to not let issues overlap. So legislator A is votes conservative on everything and votes for gun control. What would you do? You let him go go by because he's voting better than everybody else on all the other issues, but he votes for one issue that's bad. Well, thankfully, I'm a single, I have Florida Gun Rights for a single issue organization, so we can attack the guy who voted bad on guns all day long. Um, so it's important to hold people accountable for each vote they take, not look at them as a collective. Uh, because if that's the case, then they're always going to do something wrong. Um, so yeah, it's on us to fight for liberty and freedom. I'm really glad you guys came out tonight. Uh, something they always tell me at, uh, oh, here's a good plug. The Foundation for Applied Conservative Leadership teaches the tactics that Florida Gun Rights uses, the National Association for Gun Rights uses them, uh, National Right to Work Committee, National Pro Life Alliance. Um, various organizations use these tactics uh, that I, I talked a little bit about here. Well, there is a, um, a political leadership school. It's a one-day school on a Saturday. I believe it's December 12th down in Land O'Lakes. Um, so that's an awesome place to go. Uh, you can network with fellow liberty lovers and learn how to better fight back. Um, if you want more information, I'll have to pull it up on my phone. Um, so just get with me after. But uh, the they always tell us uh, in these classes, that you're weird. Every one of you is. You're sitting here on a Wednesday night 
uh, listening to this guy talk about politics instead of being with your family, watching TV, doing whatever you would normally do. Um, so thank God for weird people like you who are willing to come out on a Wednesday night and uh, get involved in the fight for liberty. Thank you so much, DJ. Uh, get with DJ after if you come up with any questions afterwards. If you want to know more about that event. Thank you for so much for coming all the way from Tallahassee. Well, we, Thank you guys for having me. We really appreciate it. Like I said, it's one of my favorite things to do, especially when it's a room full of Liberty lovers and I don't get yelled at. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on your distribution list now, so when you have stuff that we can take action on, please send it my way. We'll do. And I'll, I'll distribute it out. I have an email distribution list, list left over from the North Lake Tea Party that still has 400 active members in it, even though we're not meeting anymore. So that's where I distribute a lot of the information that we need to take action on. So please don't hesitate to do that. Okay, our next, our next speaker is Bob White. He happens to be the chairman of the Republican Liberty Caucus of Florida. He's the guy that sucked me into doing this. <laughs> Him and John Holman, and I didn't give John Holman enough credit, because John Holman was with the Liberty First Network, which is an organization that I've been personally contributing to, and the North Lake Tea Party did, and we've been on many trips up to Tallahassee with John. John is, is a, a lobbyist up there, who has lo been lobbying how many years? 16. 16 years on the stuff that we care about. Right. Liberty stuff. So John is, thank you. And, and okay, Bob White, Chairman of the Republican Liberty Caucus, fourth generation Floridian, right. with a passion for politics, an unwavering commitment to the Constitution and limited government. He serves as the chairman of the Republican Liberty Caucus of Florida, chairman of the Republican Liberty Caucus of Central East Florida, and is a, the founder and former chairman of the Liberty Catalyst Fund. Please welcome Bob White. Thank you very much. how great it is to be in Lake County, Florida's first ever Second Amendment Sanctuary County. I thank you. It really is great to be here. And let me just also say that in, in thinking about coming over here, I actually was wondering to myself if Carrie Baker was going to actually be here tonight. Because, you know, when you're in the presence of Carrie Baker, that's like being in the presence of gun rights royalty. I mean, so kudos to you, sir, for everything that you did as a member of the Florida legislature throughout many years. Uh, and you got a great legislative delegation. Anthony Sabatini's name has come up many times this evening, and rightfully so. Uh, I mean, this guy has kind of taken uh, the, uh, the Florida legislature a little bit by storm with some of the uh, with some of the bills that he's introduced. Uh, Andy mentioned our. our uh, Liberty Lobby Days event that we do, and uh, he was one of the people that we met with last year uh, during his freshman session, and I was telling a little story about Anthony. It's like, you know, um, when, you, when you come to Tallahassee as a freshman legislator, it's not uncommon for leadership to say to you, you know, you're a freshman, it's your first year, you probably shouldn't try to take on too much, it should be just a learning experience for you, and just kind of, you know, kind of take it all in and, and don't overexert yourself. And, and Andy's, um, uh, excuse me, and Anthony's like, uh, yeah, really? Hold my beer. Uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, he launched into just sponsoring several different pieces of legislation that were, you know, quite controversial in some cases, uh, but he carried them all extremely well. And of course, Dennis Bagley's name has come up. And this is, Senator Bagley has just been terrific through the years. The Republican Liberty Caucus has been doing this, going back and forth to Tallahassee now for many, many years. John is our legislative affairs director, if you will, for our organization, and is on our board of directors. Uh, and he's been a fixture up in Tallahassee working on liberty legislation. And it's interesting, here's, here's my perspective on Tallahassee. We've never really had a big problem on the House side. 
Now, our issues are generally very well received on the House side. But then, uh, for some reason, over on the Senate side, that's where, that's where the issue has always been. We've been supporting campus carry and open carry for many years and never had a problem on the House side. But on the Senate side, it's just it's like they just don't want to hear about it. And it's always been Republicans yep. that have been the stumbling block. It's been the Republicans that have prevented it from happening. You know, the Criminal Justice Committee on the Senate side has either had members that would have voted for it for good bills, good gun bills, and a chairman that wouldn't schedule them. Or a chairman that would schedule them, but they changed the makeup of the membership to the point where the votes weren't there. So even though the chairman would have scheduled the bill for a hearing, he didn't have the votes uh, and knew it. So there wasn't much point in going ahead with it. So it's, it's always been Republican senators that have gotten in the way of that. So it's been really, really tough. Um, but, but as I said, gun rights has always been a big issue for us as an organization. So this year, after seeing 7026 passed two years ago, and seeing the net effect of the red flag laws especially, can anybody, does everybody know what an RPO is? It's a, called a risk protection order. And what happens is, is that uh, if someone feels that uh, somebody they know or a family member is a threat to either themselves or someone else, they can go to law enforcement and make their case to law enforcement, and then law enforcement can go to the judge, go to the court, and get the court to issue an RPO, a risk protection order, that allows them to go knock on the front door of this person's house, and when they open the door, say, I'm here with an RPO, a risk protection order, and I'm taking all of your guns. And that's the first time this person has ever even heard anything about it. Now, that's not due process. They get a hearing, but they don't get the hearing until after their guns have already been confiscated. So that's a huge, huge issue. Does anybody know how many of these things have now been issued, these RPOs have, that have now been issued around the state of Florida since the bill first got enacted, not even a year and a half ago? Anybody want to take a guess? How many of them? 2,000. Close. As of, I believe it was August, there were 2,550 of them that had been issued wow. around the state of Florida. So that number's probably up to 3,000 or more now. And what's crazy about them is, is that in a county like mine, Brevard County, I was talking to our sheriff today, Wayne Ivey, and since the thing's been issued, he's maybe, he's maybe, or since the red flag law has been passed, he's maybe gone to the court a total of 19 times to get an RPO go and confiscate, confiscate someone's guns. In Polk County, the sheriff there is like up to like 350 something of them. There's two counties of very similar size, but there's the difference in the way in which the, the two sheriffs in these two counties are, are implementing that law. So it's a huge problem uh, statewide, and now that's one of the things that they're, that they're rumbling about is, on the Senate side is that they might actually uh, work make the law even worse than it already is because right now it has to be law enforcement that goes to the court to get the RPO. They're actually talking about making it so that an individual can bypass law enforcement altogether and go straight to the court. So an ex-husband, an ex-wife, uh, somebody having marital issues, a brother, an uncle, whatever, would then be able to go straight to the court and ask for them to issue an RPO. And then, and then call on the sheriff to enforce it. So that's a huge, huge problem. So when we saw all these things happening, and Senator Galvano, President Galvano on the Senate side, which by the way, anybody familiar with um, Michael Bloomberg's Anytown yeah, USA? Yeah, yeah. Okay, anybody want to guess how much money our Republican Senate president took from Michael Bloomberg's Anytown USA pack? A lot. $500,000. $500,000. And he's spending it on other Republicans' campaigns. Of course, that's, that's what they do. That's what the, that's what leadership does. They have these big funds and they collect all of this money, and then they reward the, the members of their of their chambers that will support them with big contributions into their political committees. That's just the way that racket works. So when we saw that happening, we thought we've got to start pushing back against this. Anybody familiar with another organization called Bond? B A W N. Anybody know what BOND stands for? Ban Assault Weapons Now. This is, the, this is the group that's headquartered down in southeast Florida. 
that sprang up after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas thing. And what they're pushing for is a constitutional amendment that would be on the ballot next November that would ban what they're referring to as assault weapons, which is nothing more than a semi-automatic weapon. It's exactly what DJ was describing. They would say that any, any weapon that would hold more than, uh, than, than nine rounds would, would fall into that category. So you've got all of, these, all of these threats that are coming at us from the Florida legislature, from this petition group. And so we started thinking about that as the Republican Liberty Caucus and said, they've got the narrative right now. You know, they're the ones that are pushing the narrative, and the narrative is a progressive narrative that's, that's nothing but, but absolute more infringements on your constitutional rights. We said, we've got to do something about it. So what we decided we would do is we would try to schedule gun rights preservation forums around the state of Florida, if you will. Do what we refer to as a gun rights preservation tour. Uh, and this is the first time. So you're the first stop on the tour. Uh, Andy told me that uh, you know that your meeting was going to be about this uh, this topic tonight. And I said, great, I'd love to come over. Let's call it a forum. We'll let you know we'll let Lake County uh, be the very first one. So that gun rights preservation forum, we have about six others already scheduled in different places. A couple out in the Panhandle. Uh, we've got one in my home county, in Brevard County, uh, Sarasota, Manatee. Senate President Galvano is from Manatee County. And we've got one scheduled in Manatee County. And the Republican Liberty Caucus of Florida is doing that one in conjunction with uh, the Manatee County Tea Party. And Florida Gun Rights, uh, one of the first things we did was we picked up the phone and called DJ and said, hey, would you guys be willing to be a co-sponsor of the tour along with us? So you've got the RLC Florida and Florida Gun Rights that are putting this tour on around the state of Florida. And we're going to try to educate the public about the threats that are, that are coming our way. <laughs> and then give them a lot of information, arm them with some really good information, really good talking points. Uh, if you did not pick up uh, this document, it's in the back of the room. This comes from gunfacts.com, uh, and there's a ton of really good information here about a lot of the myths, if you will, uh, that have to do with gun rights. And so that's a really good, uh, a really good document for you to, uh, uh, to pick up on your way out the door. And then we also want to give everybody some, some action items. Okay, so that when they leave one of these forums, they didn't just come and, and learn. We're going to give them some actually actual things that they can do uh, to try to, to try to help our cause and to push back against this anti-gun rights uh, movement that is out there. And I'm going to ask John Hallman to come up. John, as I said, has been is our legislative affairs director, if you will, for uh, for Republican Liberty Caucus of Florida. And he put together this document for me, Call to Action, Preserving Our Gun Rights. And there's some actual action items uh, on this that John's going to give you guys that you can actually do when you leave here this evening. So, John, go ahead. Thank you, Bob. So, um, let me just take a, a couple of minutes to explain it. As DJ said, and he's absolutely correct, the culture on um, guns has changed in the legislature. When I started 16 years ago, lobbying for conservative groups, and there was a guy named Senator Baker up there, I mean, there was no chance that any gun control bill would ever pass, right, Kerry? I mean, this was not going to happen. Right. And, and I used to, over the years, and somebody called and go, John, some Democrat just filed a bill, you know, to, to a gun control bill, and I would laugh and go, yeah, that's fine. They can file them all day long and even get hurt. There was a guy named Senator Greg Evers that, uh, he was from the Panhandle. He's passed away, unfortunately, and, and he was a real solid gun guy, uh, like Kerry. And uh, he used to say, and he got up uh, during the, uh, I think it was 2016 and uh, 17, that he was the uh, chairman of the Criminal Justice uh, Committee in the Senate. And he was a, a good old boy, and I can say that because I'm a seventh generation clerk. I've so been bought by three generations. Um, so I can talk that I know of. <laughs> right? So, um, you know, he had a southern draw, and he would say, Yeah, they can file all the gun control bills they want to, and they ain't going to see the light of day in my committee. So that, that was Greg Evers. So, anyhow, what changed? Why in 2018, that, you know, obviously in response to a tragedy, did they have to add gun control to the bill? So let me just tell you real quickly what's been happening over the years is when Kerry was up there, I think it was in 20, Kerry, were you still there in 2010? Yeah, I was. Yeah. In 2010, there's 40 senators. The makeup after the 2010 election was 28 Republicans to 12 Democrats. Big majority. And the House, uh, at one point, had 80, they have 120 House members. It was 82 to 38. So there's not many Democrats.
photographs up there during uh, 2010, 2012, and that, that time range. Uh, but what happened over the years, as we came up in the 2018, the, the, the big majority of the Senate had dwindled. It is now 23 to 17. So that means they're three seats away from losing control that they've had for 20 years. And so what they did in 2018, and I, I got this from a really good source, is that Bill Galvano, Senate, uh, he was then the rules chair, uh, Senate President Desmond, did he go, we, we just got to do something, you know, because of this tragedy, we got to do something. And what he said, from what I found out, from a whistleblower, by the way, <laughs> um, was that he's, he said, he, he told his uh, Republican caucus, look, we could lose the Senate in the 2018 election. <coughs> Actually, they did lose one seat. It was 24-16, it was and they lost one seat in 2018, uh, Senator uh, Dana Young. And so he said, look, if you look at the makeup of Florida, Florida is no longer a red state, right? I mean, it's a purple state. Maybe trend in blue. And you have uh, about a third of the voter registered or, or MPAs, no party affiliation. So we don't know where they think, right? So the, or politicians don't really know where these MPAs are. And so they're, they're scared. As you said, you know, they're, they're nervous, you know, because they want to win an election. And so what they have is that we now, we now have fifty dollars. So what we have now is that we, we, we saw that, get. that Governor DeSantis, out of eight million votes, won by what, ten thousand, twelve thousand votes against a far left progressive. I'm not talking about a moderate and old Florida Southern Democrat. I'm talking about a far left progressive, and he could and DeSantis could only win by a few thousand votes. So that has sent shockwaves. So that's why where DJ's right, we have to really stand up because right now the Republican leadership is listening to the polls and they're looking at the voter registration and they and they you know they think you know we lose three seats, we're done, we have no more power. So we have they, that's what's correcting these gun possible gun bills that are coming up, is fear of that they'll lose the Senate. The House is more secure. You know, they but that even the House has started to dwindle. And it used to be 82 to, to uh, 38, and is now like 73 uh, to, uh, uh, what would that be, 39, right? Uh, seven, so 120. Yeah. So, four, yeah, that's right, 47. 47. 73 to 47. So you can see even, even the House has started moving to the left, and there's more vulnerable seats. You, you know, the senators, you've always had, you know, if you had a big, you know, Senate district's bigger, and there's a chance that you may have a sort of a swing district, right? And so you might, uh, like, like DJ said, uh, I don't know if I can be really, you know, real conservative. And it depended on the districts. And a lot of these districts are becoming swing districts, but it's now infected the House. There's now more House seats that are like, I, I talked to a, to a, a who's, who's always been a strong conservative Republican up there. And I won't give, give his name, but he says, John, I just, uh, you know, I only won by a handful of votes in my house district, so sorry, I may not be able to help you this year. Um, so that's the way it is. Not true with Anthony, <laughs> but, uh, um, but there are some up there. So anyhow, that's what we're facing, and DJ's absolutely right. If, if we don't want to see further deterioration of our gun rights, we've got to be loud, and we've got to stand up, and we're going to have to, to do everything we can. So that's why uh, Bob and I put together some action items uh, to reflect uh, what, where we think on strategy of where we need to start with, with making phone calls. And so, you know, there's obviously the leadership, so you can call the Senate President's office. Uh, the majority leader in the Senate is Kathleen Casadomo. Um, and then the House is, uh, Speaker of Jose Oliva, and the Senate, or the House Majority Leader is Dane Eagle. So always, you know, if you can make some e uh, phone calls and emails just so they hear from people. Um, that, that would be helpful. And then over on the Senate side, Senator Pres uh, President Bill Galvano has tasked uh, Chairman Tom Lee of the Infrastructure and Security Committee to, and let me get his quote, I want to get his quote right. I don't want to misquote the guy. So he said in the, I believe it was the Tampa Tribune or the Herald Tribune, 
uh, he said in an interview that he plans to have a robust debate on gun violence, one that will include the possibility of new gun restrictions. New gun restrictions. Such, such as increased background checks and expanding Florida's red flag law that Bob about. Uh, DJ mentioned the, the uh, background checks, universal background checks, and maybe you, you mentioned this, but uh, DJ's right, it will lead to re registering guns. Because you have to ask yourself, what it, what it says is that all sales, private sales, you know, if I go to you and go, hey, I got a, you know, I got a old hunting shotgun, and you know, I, I just, I, I'm getting a new one, so you want to buy mine for a couple hundred, it's really good. And you go, yeah, and you hand me 200 and I hand you a shotgun. If this passes universal background checks, we just committed a crime. So that means that you and I would have to go down to a licensed dealer, like, who's a licensed gun dealer in here? Is there a licensed gun dealer? <laughs> and you'd have to go to see Carrie and ask Carrie to facilitate the sale. I mean, Carrie would probably charge a little fee, right, Carrie? Just maybe a little one. I'm not going to take a liability. Go somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, so my question is every time I talk to a legislator, is on this, well, what's wrong with universal background? We already have background checks when you go to a gun dealer. What, what's the big deal? And I said, let me ask you one question. This is one question I ask almost any bill that they're always proposing up there. And it's, what, how will you enforce this? If you pass universal background checks, how will you enforce this? How do you know that, you, that, that we made a gun deal uh, on Highway 48 on the side of the road? How is the government going to know that we did that? There's only one way. There's only one way. And that's where they're going to have to start. Register, you're going to have to register your gun so that if you get stopped or if they search your house for whatever reason and you have a gun that is not registered, you're going to jail. So that's where that will lead to. If anybody tells you universal background checks is no big deal, we already got to do background checks, it's a big deal. So anyhow, let's, let me just finish up here. So I've included in this, Bob, I included the members of the Senate Infrastructure and Security Committee. Tom Lee, as I said, they're going to be debating uh, what gun legislation they want to do this year. And so again, Democrats have filed a lot of bills, and, not, and, and so not any one standalone bill will pass, but what they'll do is they'll use it for an idea, right? DJ, in 2018, when they put, put the uh, three-day waiting period for, for long guns and the, the red flag law, or all bills that were filed in 2018 by Democrats, they didn't pass them as standalone bills. They put them into a, a committee bill and then passed that. So that's what we got to look out for. So I always say, you know, the Democrats' uh, gun bills may not, may not move, but they, they give ideas to, to Bill Galvano. Like, oh, that's a good idea. Let's throw that one in there. Um, so anyhow, I got the members of the Infrastructure and Security Committee because they, they will be putting something out. So you need to let them know that under no terms, do, you know, we cannot pass any more gun control. And, and there's other things, right, DJ, besides universal background checks and, and uh, uh, the, the red flag laws expanding. There's other ideas, right? I mean, there's all kinds of ideas that are out there um, that they, they, may, they may do so. We just got to let them know, no, you know, no more gun control. Um, and so if you make those calls, uh, and then, so that's, that's basically the two committees. Now, I've, I uh, will be informing you more as we go along. I know DJ will be putting out some good alerts <clears throat> on what's going on up there. Um, but this would be a great start if you could help here. Uh, call the Infrastructure and Security Senate Committee and call the leadership of both chambers. It would be a great start. I have talked to, uh, I've met with, and I know DJ has too, uh, members of the Criminal Justice Subcommittee in the House, which Anthony is, is on, the, on that committee. And I've gotten a really, I, I feel pretty good, don't you, DJ, that they, there, there's several of those guys uh, that are going, yeah, you know, I don't care if the legal wants it. We're not passing any gun control. So, you know, we, we need to stand with those, with those guys. Uh, I just don't think they're going to take any action on program. So. But they, you're right. So, yeah, so I've, that's the other thing. So I've talked to several up there, and they said, look, John, this may be the year for defense. I think you talked about that, DJ. It's defense because we're, you know, it's just going to be really hard to pass any any pro gun laws. Um, but we got, but DJ's right. We got to get behind constitutional carry. 
because they got to know. So say, you know, when you when you talk to your legislator, say, look, I want you to co-sponsor constitutional carry, or if it's a senator, tell them I want you to file a companion bill for constitutional carry, and they got to know that. Well, geez, we're thinking about doing background checks and, and expanding red flag laws. I don't know if we should do it because they want constitutional carry. You know, I mean, so we got to let them know, like, you know, you're going the wrong way. So anyhow, um, stay tuned for other further uh, updates on that. Um, any questions before I yeah. sit down and shut up? Let me, let me just very quickly. If you haven't got this, get it on your way out. There are very, as John was alluding to, he didn't, he's actually, I mean, he's got very specific recommendations of things to say to these legislators when you get them on the phone or in the email that you send them. And their email addresses are there, their phone numbers are there. What you need to be able to get a hold of these folks is right there in that document. It's a great document, great action item for you to take away. Did you, did you uh, get the, um, the, the action alert that I sent you by email? Can you pull that up? Other than that one? Yeah, well, I sent you, a, it was like forwarded you an email of a legislative action alert that John had put out. Mm -hmm. I, thought, I thought that was it. Well, it's a different one, but it's okay. What about our website? Can you pull up our website? Um, Can you get online and pull up RLC Florida? Or just RLCFL.com? Or .org? I don't know if you can or not, but if you can, that'd be great. It's not really a question, but I just finished reading uh, Why Leto Die. It's a great book. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I haven't read it yet, but I want to. Yeah. And I think everybody should read it. I was done with it. Yeah. Uh, there you, there you go. All right. You want, you want Bill Track? Yeah, click on Bill Track. It's slow. This is, the, this is the Republican Liberty Caucus of Florida website, rlcfl.org. And John added to our, to our menu bar just this year, 2020 Bill Tracker, and he'll be updating this throughout the legislative session. And what it's going to do is like, there's category, firearms. It's got the bill number, the bill name, who it's sponsored by, um, whether or not we support it or oppose it, and then a summary of the bill, who the co-sponsors are, and then it gives you the committees that it's been referred to. And so as we go throughout the legislative session, as a bill gets scheduled in committee, it will be updated the bill tracker, okay, so that you can see how the bill is tracking through the process, uh, which is a, a, it's just a great way to stay informed, not just on firearms, but on the other issues that are important to us as an organization. Because we get involved in criminal justice reform, trying to end red light cameras, uh, you know, government regulation, trying to eliminate them, you know, trying to reduce government regulations. Lots of issues that we get involved in as an organization that will all be met there on that, on that website. So I, I like great tool, great resource. I want to make one more comment because a lot of people say, when John, you send out your alerts, you, you know, a lot of times you, you see this, you, you get these pre-made messages, you know, and you just, you know, cut and paste it in there. So, not very effective. Um, they want to hear two, two things. First of all, constituents has great power. So, you know, when you're a constituent of somebody, that really carries a lot of weight. Um, but still, you know, even if somebody's not on the on the infrastructure and security committee, they, even if they're not, um, which I don't think you are, between uh, Vince Baxley and uh, who, who's that was under Kelly Sargent. Uh, Sargent. I don't believe that either of those are on infrastructure and security. But Kelly needs some calls. Yes, but she, she, needs, she needs some help. Yeah, she needs some yeah. help. And uh, but what they really like, and, and Carrie can attest to this, is like when somebody writes in their own words, and why this, you know, why this affects me, and why I'm, I'm, I feel passionate about it. So I actually refuse to do pre pre made messages. And I, I've been involved with organizations, and I said no, I'm not doing it because I, you know, I don't want to waste anybody's time, and I know the effect that a, a you know, just to take a few minutes. You know, like Bob said, I try to put as much information, you can get some ideas of what to say, but I, I want everybody to say something different, because um, that has more impact. Uh, so anyhow, I just want to let you know that I will ask you to do a little bit of work there. <laughs> and another, listen, Andy mentioned it earlier, lobby days on the 21st and 22nd. The legislative session convenes on Tuesday, January 14th. And we're going to be there the very next week. Um, that Monday is normally we do our event on Monday, Tuesday, but that Monday happens to be Martin Luther King Day, so they won't be doing anything that day. Uh, so we're going to do it on Tuesday, Wednesday. And the way
way we structure this is uh, it begins at Tuesday, usually at 12.30 or 1 o'clock in the afternoon. We give everybody the morning drive time to get up to Tallahassee. And then from like 1 o'clock in the afternoon through the rest of the afternoon, uh, we've got appointments already preset uh, with various legislators. Uh, some of them come to us. We get a committee room uh, on the Senate side and, and schedule some, some senators to come to us or some others to come to us. And then for a couple hours later in the afternoon, we're sending people out to go to these prearranged meetings uh, with various legislators. And then that evening, we have uh, a legislative reception uh, at the JMI headquarters, which is a really nice, you know, James Madison Institute has a really nice facility close to the Capitol. They've got a big back porch, covered back porch. Uh, we put a reception on there with food and beverage, and we invite legislators to come to that. So it's a little bit more relaxed, social kind of an atmosphere. You get more of a chance to really talk one-on-one -on -one with legislators and sometimes their aides. And then the next morning, we start early in the morning. Uh, same thing. Uh, lots of appointments with various legislators. We usually try to get into the governor's office to not necessarily meet with the governor, but to meet with some of his staff, which is always a great experience. Uh, and then uh, we usually try to wrap it up by 2.33, 3.30 in the afternoon to give everybody an opportunity to, to drive home. So it's a two-day event, uh, power-packed, and uh, I think we had 33, 34 people this past year. Uh, we'd love to see that number go up, so take advantage of the Dubois 10-passenger van and, uh, you know, make your reservation early and, uh, and come join us. It's a great experience. It was good to see how the sausage gets made or doesn't get made uh, in Tallahassee. So we'd love to have you come. Seriously, it's a great event. I'd like to say just one thing. I used that list today. There's only maybe eight or ten email addresses there, and it's real simple with me. I just oppose any and all gun restrictions. Mm -hmm. yeah. It can be as simple as that. Yeah. And I was actually looking in the Republican Party platform today. There's a nice couple of paragraphs in there that address exactly this. If you're a member of the Republican Party, in 2016, right? And by the way, that platform goes for four years. If you're a member of the Republican Party, you should support these things, which these guys, Galvano and company, are voting against. Right. So, I, you know. Just to summarize, look. Good. Go ahead. Oh, thought somebody else was talking. Uh, just to summarize what the platform says, um, it supports national reciprocity, so being able to carry, if you have a permit, being able to carry in any state. But then it gets down into saying uh, that the Republican Party supports the legislation, the constitutional carry legislation being passed in the states, and uh, applauds the legislators who uh, work for its passage, which I found that out the other day and I uh, was very happy to see that. Uh, it also, uh, the 2016 platform, which was before the craze, this renewed craze for uh, red flag gun confiscation, says that they oppose any sort of uh, restriction on the right to bear arms without due process. Uh, so the Republican Party platform of 2016 uh, supports constitutional carry, opposes red flag gun confiscation, and it, it talks about a few other points. Uh, but it, it's... These guys are breaking their oaths of office, and they're also betraying the uh, the platform of the party. And if you get a chance, contact Senator Rick Scott's office and contact Senator Marco Rubio's office, because they are both pushing for federal legislation that would incentivize states to pass red flag laws. Yeah. That's how bad this is, okay? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's threats everywhere you look. DJ mentioned the bill that Senator Simmons is contemplating. I don't think this actually hasn't been officially filed yet. That bill's terrible. It's a terrible bill. He's a Republican senator. So guess what? We wrote a letter to him uh, complaining and, and encouraging him not to file the bill and told him that we would oppose it if he did uh, and told him that we objected to his characterization using the language assault weapons, uh, which, you know, a semi-automatic rifle is not an assault weapon. Uh, we put him on the spot about the, uh, the way he was characterizing the, these weapons. He's from a district that's all Seminole County and goes up into West Volusia County. Well, guess what? We have a West Volusia County chapter and we have a Seminole County chapter and we're going to do a joint gun rights preservation forum between those two and we're going to invite him to come. We're going to tell him that his bill, if he files it, will be one of the topics that will be hotly 
you know, hotly contested that evening, and we're just going to give him the opportunity to come and defend his bill if he would like to take advantage of that. Not that we expect him to, uh, but, you know, we're going to kind of put him on the spot. We've got to start doing this. We've got to start really pushing back against these people when they file this kind of legislation or threaten to file this kind of legislation. We've got to put them on the spot. We need your help to do it. And I tell you, that's probably coming from the top. He's been tasked. I'll bet you're right. I bet you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that uh, Simmons helped Senator Baxley back on their representatives write the Stand Your Ground Bill. He did. Um, so you got 2005, Senator Simmons writing one of the most program pieces of legislation in the country. And now we're 2019, and he's pushing for some of the most absurd gun control you can imagine. And what's funny is that uh, Dennis Baxley and, and uh, Simmons are sharing an apartment. You know, a lot, a lot of people don't buy a home up there. They just they, they go up there and they rent a place. And a lot of, a lot of legislators will say, well, let's split one, you know, and they get a two-bedroom apartment. And so Dennis, Dennis, and Sim, Dennis who's very pro-gun, and Simmons, who's talking about doing this gun control bill, I mean, they... They see each other every night, you know, at the end of the night, at the end of the day, so that's funny. I wonder what kind of conversations they're having. Probably not about guns. Right. Is there a review on this petition that's come out? Which one is that's this? That's from the RP of that. Yeah, you know, this, is a, this was really interesting. I, you know, i got to tell you, I, um, this, this originated at an RPOF quarterly meeting that was held in, uh, uh, out in the Panhandle. It was the, the last one that they did, I think it was back in August, if I'm not mistaken. And I try to attend as many of these RPOF quarterly meetings as possible. And I went to the what they call the Second Amendment Committee. And all the chairman wanted to talk about was um, national reciprocity and a bill that would, um, uh, and a federal law, with a mandatory death penalty for anyone that kills a law enforcement officer. So it would take murder of law enforcement officers out of the hands of the states and make a federal statute out of it. I'm not sure I agree with that at all. I think that's a, I think that's a state's issue to begin with. And I, you know, I stood up and very vociferously complained to him and the other members of that committee that they needed to start paying attention to what was going on in Tallahassee, that that's where the real threat was coming from. And it just falls on deaf ears. And then, you know, bless his pointed little head, Joe Bruders, who's the chairman of the Republican Party in Florida, and is a member of the Florida Senate, he comes, to walk in, in, he comes walking in and says, oh, you know, you're hearing a lot of stuff about, you know, what the Florida Senate's going to do, and I'm just going to tell you right now that, you know, don't worry about it. None of that stuff's going to happen. And I'm like, you know, that's, that's ridiculous to suggest that none of that stuff is going to happen and just trying to dismiss it out of hand. We ought, there ought to be, I think there ought to be a rule change in the Republican Party of Florida that an elected, that a, an elected official ought not to be able to serve as the chairman of that organization <laughs> because they always end up trying to color the, the, the debate of, of, the, of the Republican Party of Florida to fit the narrative or the agendas, if you will, of legislative leadership in the two chambers. I think that's a big problem. Um, but take a look at the, who we've had. I mean, I like Blazing Goliath, but he was chairman for four years, member of the Florida House. Now we've got Joe Bruders, who's a member of the Florida Senate. Uh, he's the new chairman. Who knows how long he'll be there? Uh, but it's just, it's almost like, it's almost like the party's been neutered at the state level uh, because of the fact that we allow uh, elected members of the Florida legislature to basically run the party. Uh, so. And I, want to, yeah, I just want to make a quick point, too, and, and I told, I, I spoke to a group down in St. Lucie County, and I said, you know, they're sitting there, leadership's worried about the election, and like, oh, you know, it's, uh, we're a blue state, and, you know, we've you know, we got to be careful, and, and I said, you know, there's one person that's going to get really hurt. If they pass any kind of form of gun control, then that's going to be President Trump, because if you get just a few, few rednecks again, because I'm, you know, from a redneck family, so I can say it. Um, you get them just mad enough that they stay home, and this is going to be a close election with President Trump. Florida is critical. Florida is critical for his victory. And if you just get just a few rednecks mad, and they stay home, and they and they and it swings over, and we we end up with President Warren or whatever other horseman they have, um, 
So that's just something I'd like to, to pass on to the Republican Party of Florida. It puts the governor in a bad position, too. It puts the governor in a bad position. It's, it could end up hurting President Trump. So this, all this stuff that the, they're over there thinking, the Senate leadership, the Republicans, like, oh, you know, we got we got to pass something, some little bit of gun control, something, something, you know, just so that we can appease, uh, you know, maybe maybe some moderate Democrats will vote. No, they're not going to vote for you. You know, what are the moderate, you know, the MPAs? And quit worrying about that. Just stand up for principles that's in the Republican charter, and let's just do it. And you know what? I think we're going to win big. I think President Trump will win big. But if we start faltering uh, on basic principles of our right to own and bear arms, then then it's hopeless. And so I just think we need to express that to, to Republican leadership. Yeah, somebody but, said it one time. But I'd rather go down fighting for that. You know, for right the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to lose. We're going to lose. Right. And let's not lose it anyway. Yeah. Over. Uh, and let's understand one more thing, okay? We've been talking about gun rights. We've been talking about the Second Amendment. Let me tell you something. It's the entire Bill of Rights that is under assault right now from the left. The progressives are after freedom of speech. They're after your freedom of assembly. You know, they're at, I mean, they're, they're after everything. We've already seen assaults out of Washington, D.C. on the Fourth Amendment rights to privacy. The Patriot Act is loaded up with stuff that violates your rights to privacy. Uh, you know, there's indefinite detention contained in the NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act. There's all kinds of assaults that are, that are uh, against the Bill of Rights, the entire Bill of Rights. Uh, not just this, this one particular, but we've got to fight for this one, because if we lose this one, lose then all. we lose them all for sure. Uh, there would be no turning back to that. DJ, adding to what John was saying just a minute ago about uh, if President Trump supports gun control, it, it could cost him. Um, look at what uh, the perfect example of this is. If you look at Rick Scott's numbers uh, in 2018 versus DeSantis's numbers, uh, it wasn't enough to defeat Rick Scott, but his uh, the, the number of people who showed up for DeSantis there it was, I, I believe, a couple hundred thousand who did not vote for Rick Scott but voted for Ron DeSantis. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I can't help but think that that's in large part because he betrayed the base. Um, gun rights is a winning issue for the Republican Party. Um, and it's also a losing issue. Uh, if a Republican votes for gun control, their constituents don't like it. So anytime they come at you with the, well, do you want to lose the Senate when they're talking about the Florida Senate? Um, that's an absurd thought process. First of all, you should be willing to stand on principle and lose if that's what it takes. But uh, most of the time, you're going to lose more votes by supporting gun control. You're going to lose your base by supporting gun control. Let me, let, me, let me just follow up on what you just said, because John and I were in Tallahassee a couple of weeks ago, and we were meeting with members of the, of his, as John said, the House you know, Criminal Justice Committee, and they were very strong. Then we also met with a senator who's a member of the Senate Criminal Justice Committee, and and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave his name out of it, his initials are Keith Perry. <laughs> you know, and, and that was one of the points he tried to make. He said, well, fellas, you know, it could be worse. You know, the Democrats could take control. And it was so obvious that Bill Galvano was That's just beating it into their heads. We could lose control, we could lose control, we could lose control. My thought is, well, if you're going to start voting like Democrats, then we've lost control already. Yeah. You know, what's the point? Now, what's the what's the point if that's the way you're going to be voting all the time? It's crazy. I do not understand why they think that the way to win is to become wishy-washy and, and nobody know where you really stand on things. Yeah. You should do the opposite. You should be more clear mm -hmm. on what you stand for. And the, here's the one thing, why? Educate the voters. Why do I believe this? It's, this is where I stand, and this is why. And then ignore the, the newspapers. In fact, if the newspapers are screaming at you, you're doing something That's about right. it. That's right. That's a good sign. Or, you know, why don't they, if they want to just pass some eyewash, why not pass some laws, you know, making cri more criminal uh, punishment for offenders of mass shooters? Or, let's throw them in jail, let's throw their family in jail. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 
they can do all kinds of eyewash that's actually directed towards the criminal activity mm -hmm. if they just want to show right. they're wanting right. to do something, if they're just wanting to be afraid of political ramifications. There are many other avenues they yeah. engage in right. besides going after the legal owners. Right. They panicked. They panicked over the over the, yeah. over the car plate thing. It happened with you know with three weeks to go in the session. You know, and it just shut down. No, it that, just shut down everything. Well, that's that right. Issue. It was a big deal. I mean, it was, it was a big deal. It was a tragedy. So, it was a yeah. Listen, I was I was up there. I was in those committee meetings uh, right after Parkland, and yeah, you know, a lot of those students were. It was kind of staged. They were brought into, but but I, you know, listen, I I was there when the, the parents of dead children got out there. So it does hit you right here, and so. You know, sitting there and listening to a father crumble down almost to the floor and cry about his daughter. You know, okay, you know, but that's still. So I, I it was a, uh, you know, just the whole place up there was lit up like that. I mean, so, but that's not excuse. Again, like Kerry said, they didn't have to pass the gun control measures. They could have done many things. And there's other parts of the bill that are actually very good. Actually, the, taking those out and leaving the rest of the bill was a good bill. You know, the school hardening and adding security in schools and things like that. And of course, you know, they were originally going to have it where teachers could be armed. Uh, then they changed it to only school personnel, uh, which now, again, last year in the session, they actually passed that the teachers can be armed if they go through 160 hours of training and such. And, um, but anyhow, you know, it, they, they let, uh, you know, but again, I still will say, with all that that was going on and, and, and the uh, tragedy that happened, you know, Bill Galvano, I'm, I'm just going to be honest, he walked into the back room and said, ladies and gentlemen, to his Republican caucus, we're going to lose. We're going to lose the next election. We're going to lose the Senate. So we've got to do this. We have to do this. To so it was to preserve their majority in the Senate. Not, not, yeah, not, not that they thought this will help stop any future school shootings, because it won't. And they know that. Bill Carvana knows that. Um, so it was purely, purely for uh, yeah, all political reality. All, all it did from a, from a gun, from a gun's perspective, it, it was, all it did was impact legal mm -hmm. gun owners. Always does. It didn't impact. It didn't impact people that, that get guns illegally, any way, shape, or form. So it didn't. It has that legislation has absolutely. I don't think it has any impact whatsoever. There's also provision, gun, gun small provisions, but there was a protection during the background check process. Mm -hmm. If they, if it was in question, if they could not prove that you were actually guilty of a crime within a three or four day period, they had to approve it. They did away with that. So there's now people that are neither approved nor declined. I have customers. And then they can't buy a gun. And they have no legal process. There's no due process because they are neither approved nor denied. And they sit in limbo. Now, now it's just a small, small amount of people. So you don't hear a lot of this clamor. But if we get the wrong governor in there who has the wrong people, you can have literally thousands and thousands of gun buyers denied their gun rights where they're neither approved nor denied. They're just pending. Right. And that's what it's called, pending approval. Right. It just sits there. I had one customer for uh, nine months, 10 months, some people for a couple of months. Um, it's, it's crazy. It's and, crazy. And, and of course, Mickey Free, the Commissioner of Agriculture, by a stamp, like 56 or 5,700 votes that you know she defeated Matt Caldwell, our, our good friend. Yeah. You know, she's not talking about changing the concealed carry permit application process. So instead of it, coming up for renewal in every seven years, she wants to change it to five years, and then there was something else that she wanted to do, Carrie, do you know what the other thing was that she wanted to? Yes, uh, she wanted annual, I believe, annual gun training. Yeah. And, or, and, or, or at least when you renew. I think it's every time you renew. Every time you renew. But, but wasn't there something that she it. didn't actually go through with it? Wasn't she also talking about the first time you apply for a permit? You have to do some kind of a mental health certification or something? No, no that, that, that's a bill that was filed. I don't think yeah. that was there. <coughs> okay. There was right. a bill that was filed that said that in order to get a you know, concealed weapons permit, that you would have to have a mental evaluation. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and you're paying for it. And yeah. you'll pay for it, and you'll get a mental evaluation. And, and, you know, this is kind of like this whole thing with the red flag law. Like, 
we're just trying to catch the crazy people, John, before they you know, do something dangerous. And I said, well, first of all, uh, the Polk County Sheriff, Judd, just did an RPO on an eight-year-old. I think that's just a little bit over the top, if you ask me. Um, and so we're dragging all these people in. What? So who gets to define who's crazy? What's crazy? You know, John wears a MAGA hat, you know, and goes to Trump rallies. He might, he might be crazy. So if we, if we can drag him in, you know, the psychiatrists will go, liberal psychiatrists will go, yeah, yeah, crazy. And so I lose all my rights. So I, we really, I really am very worried about this red flag law and all these things about mental evaluation um, because who, who decides? What's yeah. the criteria? Because the law, if you read the law, is very wide open and very vague. It says a judge can use any relevant evidence to determine somebody. And let me just know. We've got a question back here. That's all. Okay. Well, just let me finish with this one thought. Yeah. yeah. So my so my question to uh, the legislators has been because you're you're basically if you're brought in like like uh, Bob said, if you get an RPO, they come and take your guns and then say that in 14 days you get a hearing. Um, and then the judge can use any relevant evidence. And basically, they take your guns for a year and they turn you loose. And I said, well, if you're so crazy, if you're so crazy that you can lose your gun rights, why are you turning them out in the streets then? Why are you, you know, that doesn't make any sense to me. Somebody's got to explain that to me. That you think they're crazy, so I'm going to take their gun rights away, but I'm going to turn them loose because they would never harm you know, If they don't have a gun, they have no other way to harm anybody, right? They don't have a car, they don't have a knife, they don't have a bomb. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. more people are killed hammer. every year by hand, and, by fists and feet, and than are killed by my you know, so, and and yeah. yeah, so anyhow, that's, that, that's what yeah. I wanted to make sure you You had your hand up. Well, I was just going to say, my doctor said I was crazy, but I'm still competent. <laughs> no, my concern is that what they're going to do is shove it into the constitutional amendment part where they can put it out to the public and you get a bunch of folks you know, emotionally voting to pass this stuff they so they can wash their hands. That's, that's, that's the mob. That's the mob organization yeah. that I mentioned. Ban yeah. assault weapons now. That's what they're doing. And they're, they're you know, the way, that per, the way that process works is once they get to like a hundred and some odd thousand signatures on the petition, then the language goes to the Supreme Court for them to rule whether or not the language, okay, is is meets the criteria. You know, it, it can't be misleading. It has to be explanatory. It has to be somebody reading the language has to be able to really understand it theoretically. Okay. Well, they've met that threshold. They've met that threshold. Their language is being considered right now. Uh, Ashley Moody, our Attorney General, to her credit, uh, she's gone in and filed briefs with the court. Arguing against the language, uh, pointing out all the ways that it's, uh, you know, that it doesn't meet the criteria. I don't think the court hasn't ruled yet on the language, but February. I'm sure they will be soon. Yeah, February. Yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. February. And so, you know, they're continuing to collect their signatures. They got to get to 750 or 780 thousand, and then they'll, uh, you know, it'll be on the ballot, and people will react emotionally, like yep. you just said. They will react emotionally. But like Sam said, I'm reading that book too. They should read that and feel emotionally why the part was actually happening. Mm -hmm. right? It wasn't about. Yeah, if you're going to get emotional about it, why don't you get emotional about why it happened? The school you know? system, the Broward Sheriff. Yeah, that was, a, that was a failure of government at every level. Every level. Local so level, we want state level. level, the FBI was even you know, warned about this guy and, and did nothing about it. What concerns me is that, the, as I was telling you, uh, Chairman Tom Lee of the Infrastructure and Security Committee has been tasked to look at possible gun restrictions. He also was the one that was, I think, the only Republican that voted to reinstate Broward's disgraced Broward Sheriff uh, oh, no. Scott Israel. You got to stay so that, that's a that's a red flag. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. How many of you guys enjoyed this tonight? All right.